Anybody have any stories to tell from last week? You did your obedience statement. Maybe you thought about someone you'd share with. Any stories from those activities? Any? I know I prayed about praying. We talked about praying and praying and praying and praying. So not expecting like, you know, a six-day turnaround on some of these prayers. But any experiences, any thoughts, anything you'd like to share? Go for it, Paula. She shared about how she's for a long time prayed for her oldest son, um, but just needed to be reminded and to turn up the intensity a little bit and to keep on going. It's good. Go for it, Cosita. That's right. <laughs> or mute it even. Just get credit, but you didn't have to listen to it. Thank you, Cosita, for your kindness and for your commitment to interceding for other people. You are, to me, an example of what it looks like to pray and keep on praying. So thank you for that. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Bread. I'm going to let Tyler introduce what we're going to talk about today. This is from the book, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. I bring my books on stage often because I want you to know that there are smarter people out there. And I've got my material from other folks, and there's good stuff, so you can read for yourself if you'd like. <clears throat> should go to the right page, though. He said, ah, the asking part. This is where so many of us get hung up when it comes to prayer. But Jesus insists on it. He won't have it any other way. Right in the middle of a prayer as cosmic as hallowed be your name, <clears throat> as apocalyptic as your kingdom come, as contrite as forgive us, and as spiritual as deliver us from evil, Jesus includes the unavoidable, practical, circumstantial, and immediate, give us today our daily bread. Bread prayers. Earthy, immediate. The stuff of today, the things we need. If you think that there's some sort of distinction between prayer language and everyday language, if you think <clears throat> there is some way that we relate to God and then there's some other way that we relate to our daily lives, the people in our daily lives, the things that we need in our daily lives, this is the portion of the Lord's Prayer that brings it all down to earth. It pulls it out of the clouds and out of the sky and makes it about right now, right here. What we need today. When relating to God gets lofty, bread prayers bring us back to reality. 
In North Africa, you can buy a baguette for 200 malim, which is about six cents. And there are people, our neighbors in North Africa, that lived on that daily bread. You'd see it. You'd know it. You would see them. They would have maybe two baguettes, a can of tomato paste, and some oil. That's what they could get at the store for the least expensive, and that would be, that'd be their meal. They would literally be eating bread that they bought that day, and it is what they would eat to fill themselves for that day. Daily bread. I, uh, I, I have never lived there. I haven't, I haven't let myself live that dependent on God. I'm in control. And I can give myself the needed security. I have a job. I have a savings account. I have a pantry. I don't have to ask very often. But in my pursuit of control, I think I forfeit something. And that's what I want to talk about today. Something that can only be gained through daily dependence, absolute trust, in the provision of God. At a, at a nitty-gritty level, prayer is simply asking what we need, what we want, right now, right here. Give us today our daily bread. That's a prayer. That's what I need. God, I need you right now, right here, in this moment. Please, give me my daily bread. The story we're going to read today is from Mark chapter 10. So if you've got one of these bad boys, grab it. If you don't, I've got some Bibles in a basket in the back. You might grab a pen as well because we're going to take some notes and think a little bit for ourselves. Annie, are you in here? Nope. Tell her later. She did a great job. This is Mark chapter 10, the story of blind Bartimaeus. So get your Bibles open, Mark 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 46. We'll read the story again. As we read, keep your eyes open. Listen as as you read. What is it in this story that God is trying to communicate to you? What is it that stands out at you? We're gonna approach scripture that way. Then when we open it up, The Holy Spirit speaks. So we're going to read this story and discover from it as we finish it. I'm going to ask you, what is it? What's that thing? Where was it? What stood out? What did you need to hear? Then they, Jesus and his disciples, came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I kind of imagine he said that over and over again. Many rebuked him, told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped, and he said, call him. Can you imagine this moment? So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus along the road. I'll push pause on my talking and give you some space to react, to share. You've got space in the back of your bulletin. If you brought a pen... What is it? What do you need to circle? What is it that, that as we read this, 
was the thing that stood out at you that you needed to hear that the Spirit was saying to you? What do we discover as we read this story together? You can share. He kept crying out. Sounds familiar, right? He kept crying out. He wasn't polite. It wasn't like, hey, over here, maybe, do you see me? Right? Jesus asked him, what else do you want to say, Greg? That's it. He asked him. He asked him. Hang on to that one. There was a hand in the back. Go for it, Betty. He wouldn't quit. He really wanted it. Yeah. He wanted to see. Yeah. His whole life, his blindness has been impossible to heal. But maybe, maybe one's coming along that can do something about it. I don't know. What else did you see? Yeah. Yeah, he asks us. I'm going to say it a little bit different in a bit. Man, it wasn't that he just didn't give up. He like pushed past the crowd that was telling him to be quiet. Yeah, they were rebuking him. And he said, no, 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 I will not be quiet, right? It's a good line. That's right. And he jumps to his feet to come to Jesus. A couple more thoughts. Anything stand out at you personally? Uh, how do you know that? Uh, it wasn't just that he wanted to see, but he also believed that he would see. Hmm. Yeah. It's okay. There's a lot of mystery in the stories of Jesus. Like, it should confuse us sometimes or surprise us that he does things the way he does them. And there's a big one in here for me. David, go for it. One last comment. There's a, there's a wholeness, a completeness to the healing that Jesus gives. It doesn't require therapy afterwards. I mean, when you're lame, you leap. When you're blind, you see. Now, there was that one story where he doesn't quite see and he does it again and, and then he sees better. Yeah. I'll tell you what stands out at me and it leaves me with all kinds of questions. Jesus asks us to ask him. I mean, I don't know if I'm standing in that crowd, this whole thing happened like, wow, look at this. There, Bartimaeus, he's, this is day. He's going to get the, Jesus is here. Here it is. Boom, he gets in front of Jesus, and Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Like, are you kidding? This is a blind man, Jesus. He's been blind his whole life. He begs because he's blind. He's crying out to you for help. And you are going to say, what do you want me to do for you? 
is it not the most obvious thing? Of course, he wants to see. But Jesus wants him to ask. And honestly, I don't know why. Why is it that some do and others don't get what they pray for? Do my prayers really matter? I got so many questions. If God is all wise, doesn't he already know what's best? If he's all good, won't he do it whether we pray for it or not? If he knows what we need before we ask, why does he make us ask? Why does it seem that we often ask and don't receive? Why does he require that we wait so long for a response? I mean, I got all kinds of questions. There's lots of mystery. The story of blind Bartimaeus, he asks Bartimaeus to ask him. Why? Uh, this one gets a little personal for me, just so you know. Here we go. Uh, there's a picture of a post-it note in the slideshow. Um, this this, this uh, was a sticky that was behind my desk for a long, long time. You can even see that some other paper sat over top of it and it's faded. You see the corner there? Or you can even see where the push pin covered it. Uh, in 2003, uh, Greg Johnson had brain cancer, brain tumor. And uh, we started a prayer chain here at MCC, and 345 was my time. That's what that note is. That was my reminder in my office on my desk that I signed up for 345, and I was going to pray with everybody else in the church, for others in the community. We're going to pray for Greg. And I kept the note because... As you well know in the story, Greg would go to an appointment soon after. I mean, we're not even talking months. We're talking like days. We started the prayer chain. He would go to the doctor, and there would be no cancer. And that note to me was a reminder that God does impossible things still to this day. He hears the cry of his people when they pray, and they plead, and they ask, and he gives. This is my journal from March 13 this year. <sighs> some some reason I thought I would write this sermon and get through this part. Hmm. How do I feel? In short, I feel scared, worried, distant, disconnected, disoriented, yet hopeful, expectant. I was sitting at a coffee. That morning, March 13th, my mom had recently had an infection in her, in her eye that saw best, and she was going to head to the doctor soon. Once the swelling of the infection went down, they were going to get to see if the infection had caused any damage to her retina. At the moment, she had no sight. There was hopefulness that over time she would see again. I just didn't know. So I sat at that coffee and I journaled and wrote, what's the type of faith that's required? One that says God can. One that says God will. I, I know that Jesus can. He has. He does. I know that you can't have what you don't ask for. 
these two things I'm sure of. So this is how I'll pray with expectancy. Jesus, guard my heart from reservation and caution in my prayers. Bartimaeus begged for mercy. And Jesus asked him, what do you want to do? What do you want me to do for you? Well, Jesus, I want you to restore my mom's sight completely. Do more than we would expect. Heal both of her eyes. Leave no doubt that you're the one who's done this. In your mercy, make her whole again. That's how I will pray with my mom today when I call her. Name what you want. Ask for it directly with authority and confidence. But honestly, it feels really risky. James died in prison while Peter was rescued. And I'm, and I'm setting myself up to look foolish. Am I creating an opportunity for doubt and disappointment if her sight never returns? I'm just completely helpless. My capacity is zero. I'm counting on you completely, Jesus. It's only by your power and your mercy that her sight will be restored. I believe, Lord. Help my unbelief. I spent a couple hours this week looking for an app on my mom's iPad that would read the Bible to her with Siri because my mom she doesn't see she sees very little her sight has not been restored and so you need to know I wrestle with the same tension that you might as well where you've seen victory and you've seen just crushing frustration and disappointment I get the tension, and I'm asking the same question. Why does he make us ask? And I'm going to give you my best shot at it because I think there are a couple of things that come out of asking that are super important. If we're after the presence of God and we're after seeking him, living faithfully in him, we've got to ask. It's non-negotiable. So here's the two things. One, God isn't a vending machine. One of the things that asking creates is relationship. You don't have a relationship with a vending machine. Prayer isn't a formula that if you say it the right way, enough times with enough faith and urgency, voila, you get what you ask for. It doesn't work that way. Because God desires relationship he is that's just the way he is we know it because it's how he that's who he is the trinitarian god in relationship with himself he invites us into relationship with him and so asking is part of that relationship but in any relationship there's always vulnerability you're a participant You're not in control. Any relationship. There's give and take. There's consideration. There's respect. There's honor. There's there's no manipulation. No one using the other for their own purposes in healthy relationships. I mean, that's just, that's, that's what relationship is. There's asking. There's consent. I don't take or demand, I ask, I consider. I mean, asking is like bedrock to relationships. It's how two wills understand each other and respond to one another. Just think for a second about human relationships and the the occasions when you don't ask and what are not asking reveals to us about those relationships. Just put yourself in any situation, you might find yourself saying something like, well, I didn't want to ask. I, I, I wasn't sure if I should ask, or is that the right thing to do? What are the consequences? What if I ask and, oh, there's, I don't know, your nervousness or anxiety or 
I, I, I didn't, I didn't want to ask. Can you think of a time where you might have said that to yourself? I, I, oh, gosh, I didn't want to ask. Well, it, just, it might show that you don't trust that relationship. I, I didn't want to ask. I didn't know if I had the authority to ask or I was in the position or we had that sort of relationship. I didn't want to ask. Or how about this one? Oof. <laughs> I shouldn't have had to ask. I, sh- I shouldn't have had to ask. He should have known. I shouldn't have had to ask. If he cared, she cared, they would have. There's this assumption on our relationship, and you know very well where those sort of questions end up, right? I shouldn't have had to ask. No, in healthy relationships, we ask. We trust the relationship. We speak up. We say, this is what I need. We communicate expectations clearly with one another, and those expectations then can be met, or at least they can be negotiated, because we respect that relationship enough to know that I don't, don't always just get what I want. I, there's two people, two wills in this relationship, and so I think that's what's going on. When Jesus asked Bartimaeus to ask for what he wants, when God asks us to ask for daily bread, ask, ask. It's like the most common word in the Bible when you're talking about prayer, ask. He asks us because there's a relationship. We don't impose our way on one another, but somewhere in the middle of that tension of wills is the beauty of the relationship. Sometimes yes, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sometimes devastating disappointment. Sometimes delightful surprise. Because we have to ask. Asking is relational. Here's the other thing that I understand about asking. Is that, is that God is not playing charades. It's not his game. He doesn't play cosmic charades. Where there's something he's going to do. And he's going to do it whether or not anybody asks him for it. But if you can ask, at least it will, it will seem like he's answering your prayer. Dallas Willard, he's got a book. It's called The Divine Conspiracy. He writes that God's response to our prayer is not a charade. He does not pretend that he's answering our prayer when he's only doing what he was going to do anyway. Our requests really do make a difference in what God does or does not do. Time and time again, the narrative of Scripture will show that God allows himself to be prevailed upon by those who who faithfully stand before him. He actually listens. He actually cares. And he actually responds. This is a God whose heart is movable. And asking is our participation in the mysterious work of God. He's not playing charades. He's inviting us. He's empowering us. He gives us agency. He invites us to ask for things and effect change. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective, but we have to ask. Asking is empowering. Let's go back to Jesus' question. You can put it on the screen. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? I don't always know why he makes us ask. I don't know why when I ask sometimes I don't get what I want, but I've got to believe it has something to do with a God who wants relationship with his people, and that's the way relationships work, and I've got to believe it's because he's inviting us in to this work. Ask it. See it happen. What do you want me to do for you? I skipped the obedience part and the sharing part earlier on purpose because that's the question I want you to dig into. 
as you think about how you might respond to what we're talking about today, as you're thinking about how you might do something in response to the story of once blind Bartimaeus, that's the question I want you to consider. Jesus asking you, what do you want me to do for you? Is there somebody you know that needs to hear this story? Write their name down. Who can you share this story with? I'll be quiet again. Give you guys some time to think. It's okay that the room is quiet. How do you want to respond? What do you want to ask Jesus? Trust the asking. Trust the process. Trust the one who invites you to ask. History belongs to the intercessors. I actually said that to one of you last week. I don't remember who it was. We were sharing after the sermon time here in this room, and I, I quoted this, this quote. History belongs to the intercessors. Those who pray change the world. What a compelling wonder that is until we actually begin to pray and all that confidence and inspiration are drowned in a tsunami of questions and doubts and confusion and past disappointment. And so we pray the safest kind of prayers. The ones so passive and vague we'd never be able to tell if God responded to, responded to them or not. Bartimaeus comes before Jesus. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? I want to see. I want to see. He laid it on the line. Yeah, he had faith. He believed that Jesus could heal him. But he had to say it. And in that moment, he laid it on the line. That's what I want. I want to see. What if he doesn't see? We know the story, right? He sees. Jesus heals the man because of his faith. He goes and follows him. But his response is specific. I, I want to see. As a thought experiment, try to recall everything you've prayed for in the last week. Think about it. What have you prayed for in the last week? If God answered every last one of your prayers, what would happen? He says, with the exception of one or two particularly bold or naive people, the answer is usually very little. His contention is, we pray vague, nondescript, easy prayers maybe, because we don't want to put it on a line. But this is what I want. This is the thing I'm asking for. Right now, this is my bread prayer, Jesus. This is what I need from you. Do we pray with that sort of specificity that we would know if he actually answered the prayer? That's the challenge of the bread prayer. This is what I want, and this is what I want to see happen. Are our prayers specific enough, bold enough, direct enough that we would notice when God answered those requests? Do we trust the relationship enough to ask? Do we believe we have been empowered to pray in ways that matter? So I say ask, vulnerably, with enough specificity that God has the chance to disappoint you or to surprise you. 
Don't be cautious. Ask boldly with enough confidence that you wonder if you're allowed to be that forward with God. Ask. I invite you to stand. We'll sing here in just a second. I'm going to bless you. If you want to respond in any way, I'd be glad to meet you. We can chat down front. But please stand as I bless you. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.